Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we've just had a great talk from Kareem on, on delays. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce you to Matteo Saponati, who's going to be giving us a talk on a, a feedback control algorithm for online learning with spikes. And uh, Matteo is a postdoc uh, at the ETH Zurich. Uh, so please take it away, Matteo. He's got a 15 minute talk um, with uh, some time for questions afterwards. I'll just maybe, if you're going over, I'll just say something, but please take it away. Sure. Thank you, Dan, for the kind introduction. I guess you can see the slides full screen, right? All right, fantastic. So thanks again, and I'm very, very happy to you know uh, talk here as Nufa. I was talking with Dan before that I follow Nufa since the very first edition was in 2020, and I'm very happy that today I had the opportunity to give a talk here. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, work that I've done the last year as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Neuroinformatics, and my work is about uh, training algorithm for spiking your network on neuromorphic devices. Today, in my talk, I will structure it as follows. I will give very briefly some motivations of my work, and then I will introduce the feedback control algorithm that we developed, and then I will show some results on how we can prototype online and hardware-aware learning in, on neuromorphic devices. And starting with my motivations, so, uh, you know, I have a background on computational neuroscience, so I study a little bit of biology, and uh, what people in biology says is that form is function. And what they mean with that is that if you look at biological system, the form, the structure that it has, pretty much define the possible function that it can achieve. And recently, it has been pushed forward a perspective that I really, really like, and I resonate pretty much with my work, that a similar connection can be drawn from between hardware and software. So sometimes the software that actually works is not necessarily the one that is objectively better, but it's the one that best exploits the, the hardware that is running. And this connection is very important. Sometimes we kind of lose or we don't think about it that much because we work at the level of abstract, our abstraction that, you know, is uh, when, we're learn when we are training our machine learning algorithm on PyTorch, Sometimes we forget about the actual hardware that is pretty much accelerated for that and our success and the success of our algorithm. And uh, this connection for me is very important because I work with a specific type of hardware, which are called mixed signal neuromorphic devices. Those hardware are great, are very, very interesting, but most importantly, they're very far different from the standard for Neumann architectures. And first of all, they're mixed signals, so they are both analog and digital, and they directly emulate the dynamics of, let's say, leak integrated fire neurons. And most importantly also, the memory is distributed. So the memory is distributed across the synapses of each neuron. And these, these uh, hardware uh, are very interesting, but they also come with some challenges. And out of the different challenges that they have, I try to tackle a specific one, which is about, you know, how to get credit assignment on those neuromorphic devices. And what I mean by that is that how can we de develop the best optimizer for such hardware that can, first of all, it can run on chip. So it's an algorithm that can run on the specific hardware. And second of all, it can run online, meaning uh, while the hardware is actually running. And this is a, still a challenge. And the way we try to, to tackle this problem is by this feedback control algorithm that I'm going to describe to you now. So the way it works, we call it the feedback control optimizer, which is a computational primitive to program those devices online. It is basically composed by an inductive architecture of bias that we introduce to the hardware. And this architecture is composed by two modules. We have a network which is a network of uh, feed-forward leak integrated fire neurons, possibly multilayer. And then we have another module, which is the control module. The control module receives the, I don't know if you can see my pointer, maybe, yeah, all right, fantastic. Yeah, you so, can. You, uh, yes, thanks. So we, uh, the control neuron receives the output activity of the output neurons of the network and some target activity. And what it, the, the, the job of this control neuron is to drive the, the activity of the network closer 
to the target that we receive from top down. So this is a uh, this is work. It is strongly inspired by some previous work from the lab of Benjamin Gravy that I work with also at the Institute of Neuroinformatics and also other labs, which is a kind of a complementary approach to backprop. When instead of backpropagating gradients here, the whole job is that you wanna you wanna steer, you wanna drive the activity of the network in the direction of a correct target. And once you are able to do that, it means that you you know you optimize your model properly optimized. And uh, now if we zoom a little bit on how to show how it works, we zoom on uh, the, just one up to neuron is, is controlled. Basically what happens, as I said, here where uh, we live in the spike world, those are all spiking neuro neurons and the communication happens between events or spikes. So we have the output neuron is gonna send some output spikes to the control neuron. The, con the control module is composed by uh, one excitatory and one inhibitory neuron. Then they also receive the target spikes. And what they do, they accumulate across time in their member potential, the difference between the output activity and the target activity, and then they send some feedback back to the output proportionally to that. So here we are, we are encoding the amplitude of this error as the number of spikes that each one of the two control neurons sends back as a feedback. And the sign of the error is encoded by the, you know, the, the free synaptic source, either the excitatory or the inhibitory. And while this happens, the neuron, the output neuron in this case, can update the synaptic weights proportionally to the amount of feedback that it receives. And of course, to the amount of presynaptic spikes that it receives from the specific presynaptic source. So here, uh, this is very important for us because the main components, the main ingredients of our optimizer are currents and recurrent connections. So with currents from the, from the uh, controlled back to the output neuron. We don't explicitly compute gradients. Of course, the algorithm follows some sort of gradient for the optimization, but it doesn't explicitly compute gradients and backpropagate gradients through the, through the network, but it, it uses recurring connections. And those recurring connections are active while the output to controlled connections are, are also active. So there is no distinction between a forward and a backward pass, but here have, everything happens simultaneously. This allows us to have uh, online learning on the chip. And importantly also, the amount of plasticity is proportional to the amount of feedback. The more plasticity you have, the less feedback will be required. The more the network is trained, the less feedback will be required to you know, reach the target. And so there will be less plasticity. And eventually, when there's no feedback, the model converged. And we basically so trained the optimized the network for the specific task. And uh, now I'm going to show you some of the results that we have uh, on prototyping this uh, algorithm for neuromorphic devices. And the very first thing that one should do when you know develops a new algorithm is to look for the most simple case and try to solve that first. So we look for binary classification. And the binary classification that I defined here goes as follows. Imagine you have this output neuron, and this is the FF curve of the output neuron. And the binary classification is on two different inputs, uh, A and B, where in this case, A fires so 100 hertz, so fires higher, has a higher firing rate than, than the input B. So we live here, we are around 150, so this is the activity of the output unit that you see here for this one second time window. And um, what uh, the, the class that we define would be one of the two classes for the binary classification, would be I call it class A is when A, the input A is, is stronger than input B. And when this happens, I want to set a target for the for the output neuron to fire, in this case, 100 hertz. All of this, of course, is arbitrary. You can define it the way you want. But you want to define two different targets. One is target A for the class A, when A is higher than B. And when the opposite happens, when B is higher than A, you want to have another target, in this case, a lower firing rate, uh, 20 hertz, for the output neuron. And the whole job of the control would be to, during training, steer the activity to in the, the, right, in the right direction. Uh, so increase the activity for class A and decrease the activity for class B. And then the synapses uh, will change accordingly to the learning rule that I showed you before. And first, we looked at the, at the results in a more machine learning sense. 
So, you know, we define batches and we train the, we accumulate the wait updates and then we wait for the one epoch to finish and we train across epochs. And what we see here is this classification loss during training and evaluation, which is basically zero across epochs. And that makes sense because during training, the, the control is active. So when during training, these, uh, we always are, uh, th then the output unit is always able to reach the target through the, through the feedback. What happens is that you need less and less feedback across epochs. And this is clear here for the target error. You see that the um, across epochs target error is a quantification of how far the neuron is from the, from the, from the, from the target during validation. So when the feedback is off. So you, you see that the more uh, training happens, the less, uh, the closer the neuron is to the target, even without the control. And this is, of course, uh, Stone here, you see that this is the activity of the output neuron you know, when class A is present, it reaches 100 hertz. When class B is present, it reaches 20 hertz. So, so far, so good. That's exactly what we expect. And then next, we look at online learning. So now we we have batch one, let's say. So we there is one example right after the other as uh, chosen randomly. And the weight updates happen continuously. So we don't accumulate the weight updates, but each time the the neural receives at least an active spike. There is a weight update proportional to the feedback. And what we see here is that, again, now across examples, in this case, because we don't have really epochs anymore, uh, classification loss is still zero. And uh, the target error is definitely more noisy. Here, I, if I remember correctly, I'm uh, averaging every 25 uh, examples. What you see here is that the, the target error goes down. And uh, here I'm showing how the weight changes continuously across different examples. As you, one would expect, the weight for the input A goes high and the weight for the input B goes down. And finally, uh, in collaboration with Chiara De Luca, she's another postdoc at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. She's also working with Giacomo and Diveri. And we run hardware simulations. So basically, we took a neuromorphic uh, simulator of the neuromorphic chip, the Dynapsis, that are the family of neuromorphic chips that are available at the lab of Giacomo. And uh, she ran the, the same experiments with, the, with all the hardware constraints on the hardware simulator. And what you see is that qualitatively, the results are the same. So you see that the, the, it is at the target activity, the neuron reaches the target during training, and the weights for the class A are high, and the weights for the class B are low, as expected. So this was like a proof of principle that you know the the control algorithm is working and we're able to to train you know, spiking neural networks on your morphic chip online. And then next we moved forward and what we um, we looked at the uh, another type of data set which is called the Yin Yang data set, which was very interesting for us because it's relatively simple but non-linear separable. So what you have, you have three classes, and each class is like you belong either to yin, yang, or dot. And each feature, the features for each dot are the coordinates. In this case, you're going to have x, y, 1 minus x, and 1 minus y coordinates. So four features per, per dot. And um, what we've done here, we've trained a li linear readout to classify this uh, data set. And of course, we need to transform it into the spiking word. So what I've done, I converted each each coordinate into a finding grade between 10 and 100 hertz, and then each input is encoded by the activity of those four features uh, by homogeneous Poisson for following the same the specific finding grade. And then for each input, uh, sorry, for each dot, we also have a target activity where you want the neuron that encodes for the correct class to fire around 20 hertz and the others to fire lower around 10 hertz. And we did similar experiments. So first we ran a uh, machine learning sense. And here I am showing the uh, accuracy, how it, uh, it evolves across epochs for our feedback control compared to backpropagation through time with just free linear leak integrator without spikes. And the blue line is the accuracy of a standard ANN on those images here. If I convert back from filing grade to images, then I just train it as with, uh, on the coordinates rather than the spike patterns. And then what basically, what we observe is that we reach what we're supposed to reach. This is a non-linearly separable uh, uh, problem, and a linear readout can reach around uh, 63, 62%, and which is exactly what we have. 
And we see here that the target error, again, decreases across epochs. And this is the um, inference on the test set. So you see, of course, that it's a linear result. So it's going to try to uh, dissect the, the data set linearly. And it's going to get the max accuracy that it can have. So basically, we, are, we can obtain with our feedback control algorithm the same, the same results that you can obtain with ANNs. Just and to, just also to, now, okay, yeah. just to, uh, we just have a, mi a minute or so left. That works. Yes, yeah, yeah, just I'm, I'm basically over. Awesome. Yes, thank you. So the, just here, I just want to show that we can also have online learning. So basically, now again, we do the exact same approach as before. We just show one example right after the other. And you see that the classification loss goes down, the target loss goes down, and we take the same very similar accuracy as before. So in conclusion, uh, what I presented to you is a novel optimizer that is trying to match as much as possible the hardware that we have, so the mix, those mixing of devices, and it allows for online and on-chip learning. Of course, here we are still there is still some work in progress. Most importantly, we still didn't show you yet the on-chip deep credit assignment. So I've been one hidden layer. This is working process. Please, please stay tuned because you're going to see it soon. And uh, with this, I just want to conclude and thank you for your attention and I want to thank both the NCS group from Giacomo Diveri and the lab of Benjamin Gravit that are working with both of the Institute of Neuroinformatics and thank you for your attention. Matteo that was fantastic thank you so much it's such a great topic obviously thinking about like an online learning in edge devices and, and, and in your so that's that's awesome. Um, so we'll get right into it. So we've just got a few minutes. We're slightly ahead, uh, slightly behind on the schedule, but that's not because of you necessarily. We've accumulated like a one or two minutes here and there over just the first session. So um, there is a break after this. Uh, so great. So Friedman's question um, was, could you give us some more insight into how you get the right feedback? So obviously you're doing a kind of control based optimization. So, so yeah, can you give some insight into what it means to have the right feedback? Right. That's a great question. Uh, so uh, the right feedback, it's kind of easy to, to give us a, a, an answer on that when you have only one layer, because basically when you have a readout layer, what you're going to have, you, you know the target, you know the output. What the control neurons are doing are basically computing the difference between these two. Of course, here we're working in the spiking world, so there are a little bit more hyperparameters that you have to play with, the threshold of the control, the time constant of the control, but essentially that's, that's easy to, to get the feedback. The, the real problem comes when you have more than one layer mm -hmm. because the right feedback for, uh, for the hidden layer, that's difficult to find. And that's the critical problem for all these target learning approaches. And what we've been doing so far, you know, so, um, on neuromorphic devices, everything is more complicated. So what we've been trying now is to just uh, have random feedback weights and mm -hmm. allow for uh, the, you know, the control to work on, on the feedback, on random feedback, what you, one can also do if you write down the loss function has the difference between the, the target. Like you can, you can write down a loss function per layer, and then you can write down, you can derive the graded descent based learning rule for the feedback weights, which we could, so you could combine with the feed forward weights. This, in principle, should work. In practice, it can be problematic because now you're going to have two competing uh, you know, mechanisms. One, the feedback is going to change one direction. It might be that the feedback goes in the opposite direction, and they don't always converge. So mm -hmm. there are some you know, technical problems to issues deal with that. And also answers Freeman's other question, which is narrowly second, um, which was what about hidden layers and depth? But you kind of talked about how that's much more complicated. Um, yeah. We have a question from Alberto. Why do you need also one, mi uh, one uh, minus y and one minus x features in the yin yang classification? Right, that's a, that's a good point. So this is uh, something that you need in general for any uh, implementation of the yin yang data set if you don't want to add biases. So because the you know the yin yang is not centered around zero, so you can either uh, uniquely encode the position of a dot with x, y, and a bias, or you can make it redundant and define the borders of your of your yin yang, and then you make uh, x y y minus x y minus y, and then you don't need a bias for yeah for specifying the dots, which is basically the reason why you have that. Great. I think we have time for um, one more. 
Um, we've an we've answered kind of freedom and other question really, I think, with what about hidden layers and depth? Um, so uh, unless unless there's anything else on that, Matteo, quickly. Uh, but I, I mean, I think you kind of answered that. Um, yeah, I think that you know the the point is that you hidden layers they don't have a straightforward control feedback to find. You, you yeah. need to find it, and it's yeah, it's not easy. And Arish's question was, how does this relate to the spiking versions of the force algorithm? Uh, I, I, I'm not aware exactly of uh, spiking versions of the force algorithm. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer this question, but I will have a definite quick look on okay. that. Great. And maybe actually we have time then my question, which links to kind of yes. um, uh, one pre, I mean, there's a load of questions I'd want to ask, <laughs> but one is, um, is uh, basically this is, is effectively supervised, right? You know the targets. So, so can you think of other control setups that would generalize to like semi-supervised or unsupervised setups where you, it's kind of harder to think about what the feedback is? Again, you know, it's one of those harder questions maybe, or have you thought about that? Right. Uh, no, th that's a great question, and I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I would say that mm, th that could be that could be ways to uh, implement unsupervised settings or self-supervised by having basically, you know, you could control your network to, let's say, you have an input and you want to predict the next input, some sort of set mm -hmm. uh, supervised in time. You could use that as a target. Of course, what the way you can do, how to actually do it is not that trivial in my brain right now. But essentially, control is kind of a different way of doing that. There are both two different ways of optimizing a system that they are some, somehow independent of the objective function that you define, right? Of course, then how you, com you combine these two the a control and a specific optimization, like the loss function, sorry, then, yeah, it's tricky. Great. But I think in principle, you could do that, yeah. Wonderful. Um, great. I think, Matteo, that was wonderful. So to so everyone, thank you very much for the for being here for the first session. We've had three awesome talks. Um, so just to remind you on the calendar, we have a break now. We've just started, we've just finished slightly late, but um, the next session will be chaired by Julia uh, and we'll start at five past four um on uh, on ce time um so uh i think you should be ported there teleported there via um crowdcast by by the the people in the background dan and friedman who's who's sorting everything so thank you very much again mateo that was wonderful and see you all soon thank you thank you